welcome back. We uh, now have uh, another interesting lecture, which is um, about uh, megalithic giants. Um, we have uh, earlier, I don't know if any of you know of Brian Forrester, who also was a speaker at Open Mind Conference. He uh, covered elongated skulls, which also seem after the DNA samples to, to be another race on this earth. Maybe, maybe Hughes, he will convince us that the giants have been too. Uh, I find it a fascinating subject, uh, maybe because I also feel like a giant sometimes. <laughs> Um, first I heard about this was actually an interview on Red Eyes Radio with Richard Dewhurst, and, uh, which uh, was called When Giant Ruled America, which is also very interesting, uh, which also covered this uh, Smithsonian Institute cover up about all these skeletons found many places all over the world, but especially in the middle of the United States. Um, but also other places that have uh, been found, you know, 4,000 skeletons in a, a burial uh, place. So I must say, I think maybe um, if I was a little child in school and heard about this subject, I would really be happy about that teacher who told me about it. So uh, maybe it's also because I think that it was a shame I didn't hear about this when well, I was younger, because uh, if there have been giants, five meter and 20 centimeters high shoe size three times mine which is large <laughs> um, it's 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 fascinating so um, i really look forward to uh, to welcome hughes newman um, because uh, i hope he can clarify a lot of things so give a warm welcome to hughes newman Thank you, Frank. Okay, thank you very much, Frank. I appreciate that um, wonderful introduction. And um, so today we're going to be um, talking about a quite a strange subject, to be honest with you. Um, it's not something you normally probably hear at a, a fascinating conference such as this, but it, is, it has parallels because there's a cover-up going on with this story, a huge cover-up that's been going on for 150 years by major institutions, not just in America, but around the world. And we're really questioning our true origins of where we came from. If there was a giant race in North America, which I'm gonna suggest there was in this lecture and, and in different parts of the world, then why has that been removed from the historical record and deliberately brushed under the carpet? But I'm also, what got me into this was actually other research. I've been a megalithomaniac for many years. Uh, I've got a couple of books out, one called Earth Grids, looking at connections and ley lines of ancient sites around the world. I just recently just published a book about stone circles. And have any of you seen that amazing and crazy TV program, Ancient Aliens? About four of you, brilliant. Um, <laughs> So that, I've been involved in that for about the last six years. They keep inviting me on for some reason. And also there was a TV show. If you haven't seen it, it's worth ch trying to find it. It's called Search for the Lost Giants, which was uh, instigated by my co-author, Jim Vieira. I also, like Frank, I organize conferences. This is a couple of conferences I organize. One in London, the Origins Conference every November, and Megalithomania. We've been running for over 10 years, or 11, 12 years even, in May. So if you want to come over and hear more about megaliths and giants, please do. I also travel and explore quite extensively. It's one of the reasons I'm quite happy to come to Denmark. This is a very short journey. It's a two-hour flight for me. But we do get around the world. We run tours and sometimes conferences in other places. I'm very well... I'm a very good friend of mine is Brian Forrester. I believe some of you met him a couple of years ago here, and we, we organised tours. And this is really to enable us to fund our research and our travel because we travel a lot and we research a lot and we don't have any funding, any sponsors. So any income we get goes into that. But it's really the megaliths. And this is one aspect which really intrigues me. Um, I just wonder, is, do the lights need to be on, on the screen so much? Because it seems like there's a, a ble bleaching out a little bit. And 
is one aspect, for instance, out of many, is these polygonal walls we find all over the world. And on the bottom left there, we can see there's me standing there against this polygonal wall. Oh, whoops, a daisy. One more time. This is actually one of the pyramids on the Giza Plateau. This is from Peru. This is Italy. And this is Easter Island. And all over the world, we find examples of massive megalithic blocks, often attributed to giants. We find that also at many of the quarries, such as this one at Baalbek in Lebanon, where some of these stones weigh over a thousand tons. And they're always talked about giants in prehistory, in the legends, and in the folklore, connecting it all up. And now there's some truth to these myths and these legends. These are images you may have seen on the internet over the years, even over the decades. And every single one of these you see here, they've appeared in books, they've appeared on multiple websites, in articles, but every single one of them photos is a hoax. They were created in, 19, sorry, in 2002 on the Worth 1000 website as a competition who could do the best archeological giant uh, Photoshop image. And these were some of the examples that came forth. But don't let that put you off because there are some real giants, not necessarily quite as outrageously big as these, but most certainly they do exist. This is just some images um, representing the Bible, really. On the left, we have David defeating Goliath, which is everyone knows about this from their childhood onwards. On the right hand side here, we have King Og of Bashan's bed. This is supposed to be an um, extremely tall giant who once lived in the Bible lands. And this is the representation of that. So all throughout the Bible, we have hundreds of accounts of the Canaanites, the Amorites, um, and many other tribes that were witnessed and talked about in the Old Testament. And they sound very matter of fact, as we'll see a little bit later. In Britain, we have stories of Jack the Giant Killer, which later became Jack and the Beanstalk, which was a much softer uh, Victorian fairy tale. But these go way back into prehistory, these stories of Jack the Giant Killer defeating all these giants on St. Michael's Mount in Devon, even into Wales and other parts of England. And I've written an article about this, which is going to feature in the, the next book, which looks at all the giants of Britain. And we found over 100 accounts of authenticated giant bones and skeletons all across the country. And it makes you wonder why these traditions emerge. You know, are they finding bones and uh, skeletons going back over the last thousand or so years? But all over Europe, we have examples. This was a map put together by Cecilia Hall. She's a fellow giantologist. And she's been uh, researching and plotting on Google Earth many accounts, and this is just some we get from Europe and the Middle East. So we can see they really congregate all over Britain here. But all over this area, we find examples and traditions that match this. But coming back to England, even in my hometown where I'm from, a place called Cambridge, actually a village called Cherry Hinton, there's a series of hills called the Gog Magog Hills. Now these, everyone that's aware of this knows that Gog Magog was the giant that was defeated um, on Plymouth Hoe by Tro uh, Brutus the Trojan, going back into prehistory. And actually on these hills, some giant skeletons were found. There's actually a place called the Giant's Grave, which I used to walk past every day on my way to school. Um, so I find it quite weird that even in my local area where I grew up, there's very strong traditions of giants. Even at Stonehenge, we have very interesting accounts going very, very far back. This is the earliest pictorial uh, depiction of Stonehenge. It goes back to the early 1400s. Uh, and it's based on the history of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth and um, illustrated in a different version of that book by Robert Wace. And it clearly shows Merlin here, who's uh, talked about in these books with some other gentleman, and a giant lifting the stones into place. Now the interesting thing about this is that if you look into the, that particular book, The History of the Kings of Britain, which was published in the 1300s, it talks about giants bringing stones over from North Africa to Ireland. And eventually, many thousands of years later, they would then uh, 
brought over from Ireland to Salisbury Plain. And this is where uh, how Stonehenge was apparently formed, according to legend. But the first known name of Stonehenge was the Giant's Dance. That's the first, or the Giant's Ring. So there's different versions, but it was never called Stonehenge. That's a later Saxon name that basically means hanging stones. This it was a, just give you some examples of some skeletons, bones, and skulls that have been found in the Stonehenge area. This is uh, a huge skull that was noted by John Aubrey uh, that was placed outside a church, and it must have been for someone between eight and nine feet tall. We have this is uh, quite an interesting one just down the road from Stonehenge in a mound in Salisbury. Uh, a nine foot four inch skeleton was found. And this is most certainly in the Stonehenge Greater Landscape. And this was uh, found at a site called the Giant's Grave. In 1802, another skeleton was reported. This time it was 14 feet 10 inches in length. And this was reported in several different um, books and diaries and journals at this time. So where was that skeleton gone? I'd be very interested to see that. We have this version here as well, just further south, um, a few miles south of Stonehenge. A skeleton of large dimensions was found in the Woody Eights Mound Group. We have another one here, a seven foot skeleton um, was found in that area too. So the list goes on, just around Stonehenge itself, where it's said that giants may have constructed the site. And within the mounds, we actually find reports of bones. And we know that the, in that area, um, when, the, oh sorry, when the Beaker people came to the area around 2300 BC, they were a much larger type of stock than the local people were at the time. We'll get more into that later. Even in Glastonbury, where I lived for many years, there's uh, Glastonbury Abbey. And in the 1100s, this particular uh, story emerged and it's been authenticated by several different people. When the, there's a basically quite a long story, I'll just summarise this quickly. But there was like um, at the time of King Henry, there was he was there was kind of instructed in dreams to like research what was going on in Glastonbury Abbey at the time, and they dug beneath the ground uh, in a certain spot, and they found halfway down, about eight or ten feet down, they found this. They dug further down, and they found a huge coffin, like a wooden log coffin, like a Celtic style burial, which had a giant skeleton within it. And this later was described as King Arthur and Guinevere had been discovered. And this is what was described on this lead cross. But we think the lead cross was created by the monks to increase pilgrims and tourism to the area. But the genuine discovery of this uh, extremely tall, potentially nine foot tall giant is still in the records and uh, it's unfortunately lost now because it was almost a thousand years ago. But it does give hints that there's a genuine phenomenon of this in ancient England. Uh, this just shows you Europe again. We're going to move quickly over to Ireland here. This is a place called Four Knox where huge skeletons were found in the Boyne Valley. This is a very interesting site. It's near Newgrange and Tara and it's like a burial chamber, but there were many satellite mounds in the area and chambers. And in these mounds, back in, the back in 1950, very, very tall skeletons were unearthed. And this fits with the legends of the Tuatha Dé Danann and the Firbolg and others in ancient Ireland. This is probably the most famous Irish giant. This was found in County Antrim, Ireland, and it was thought to be 12 foot 2 inches tall with a girth of chest of six foot six inches, and the arms were four foot six inches long. Um, and it had six toes on one of the feet. Uh, this was found in like a peat bog, so it was preserved, it was almost um, mummified. And they had to cover it up in this area here because the Victorian women kept fainting with what was beneath there. But it got displayed in Liverpool, Dublin, and London, and then it disappeared. And, uh, and this is the photo next to a train carriage, so you can see the size of it, uh, and it completely disappeared. Now, people claim this may have been a hoax, but there's no evidence it was. Other examples, just I'm just going to give you a few examples in various different areas. Um, this was found at a place uh, called Dysart in Louth, uh, and this, they found basically a skull of various bones. Uh, 
that would have been of a person 10 feet tall. Just, just a matter of fact account from a newspaper reported by local people. This is the same kind of story we keep finding all over the world. And there just doesn't seem any reason to make this up. I mean, if they're exaggerating slightly and maybe he was nine feet tall, they're still pretty tall. Uh, even over in Egypt down here, we, we have examples, uh, obviously all over the Middle East, there's many examples. Uh, we could spend days here going through all the different ones. This is one uh, interesting example. This is from um, Philae Island, the Temple of Isis um, in Egypt. And they found, found a row of tombs in which they found seven foot tall giants, but they also found a giant which was 11 foot one inch tall. And again, this was a matter of fact account, it appeared in many newspapers um, in 1881. Where the bones are, again, we don't know. But this is one of the most compelling pieces of evidence. These are a mummified giant finger that was found um, and researched by Gregor Spory in the 1980s. And he got together and he, he got told about this former grave robber who had a sort of legacy in his family of grave robbing. And they had all these goods and other things they would sell to people. And he got taken up 100 kilometers north of Cairo to this family. They met, he met this old gentleman and this was presented to him. And uh, it was found about 150 years ago, not too far from Giza, apparently. And, and it got x-rayed, and it was proven to be a genuine human finger. But it was so big that it was like 15 inches long in total, that it must have been someone 15, 16 feet tall. Uh, and I've talked to Gregor about this, and he says it's a genuine thing. He saw the finger himself. Where the rest of the body is, he didn't know. The problem is he went back there like 10 years later to try and meet the family again and they'd moved away, they disappeared, no one could locate them. So we don't have much to go on here and I wish he'd taken a sample and done some DNA testing. I've recently written an article about uh, the giants of ancient Egypt on the ancient-origins.net website. And while I was doing that, um, we went up to the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford and they got an Egyptian display there. And I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw a boomerang in the Egyptian display going back to the first dynasty, 3200 BC of ancient Egypt, which is just one of the many connections between Australia and ancient Egypt. But this really intrigued me because here below it is a classic flint knife, which you get from that era, era of prehistoric Egypt. This is also a flint knife, or well, the end of one is about this much of it here. but. And this is clearly somewhat bigger. And you can see how big it is in this photo. And it says on the description that a very large flint knife must have been ceremonial. This is something they put on all the giant artifacts they find in different parts of the world. And this really intrigued me because in this particular area, there was a second, exactly the same site as this. Um, and I can't, it's difficult to um, actually say the title, Hieronkinopolis, I think. A second dynasty king uh, was known to be eight feet tall, also found in this same site. Uh, and, he was, and that was written out in all the early records. And so we know that there were definitely giants in very early Egypt. This is from the first dynasty from the same site. This is a, a ceremonial mace head about eight times the size that it should be. So we keep finding all these little specks of evidence that build up into some kind of suggestion that indeed there may have been at least an elite of giants existing in prehistory. As we mentioned earlier, the Bible, oh my God, it has so many accounts. It's actually a really interesting book um, after, a, if you, yeah, um, in some ways. If you're a giantologist, uh, an alternative historian, it's actually really interesting. If you're religious, I think it's even more interesting, I believe. Um, but this is some examples here. I'm not going to go through these, but you can just have a look at them uh, on the page here. But there were basically multiple tribes of giants in the Bible lands, even the famous story of the Exodus with Moses uh, and the Israelites and so forth going up into the area of Canaan. Well, that is actually the area of the giants, the Canaanites, the Amorites. Um, and they witness them, and this is written about in the Bible, it's in the New Testament, and they have to defeat them, they have to battle them to kind of take control of the land. And, so that, and it's just matter of fact. And these are just some of the accounts that came from that era and the earlier era from the Old Testament. 
So there's a big drama about this. There's a lot of people in America. There's some excellent research, Steve Quayle, um, and others like L.A. Mazzulli, who, who are like Christians who are researching giants from a biblical perspective. And actually, they've come up with some really, really good stuff. And I must credit them for some of this, some of this research from the Bible lands. Even in Italy, if we just uh, jump around a bit around Europe, um, for numerous examples, this is just uh, a couple of examples uh, of a seven foot tall skeleton, um, both around seven feet tall. We have this story here from uh, 1838. Uh, Captain James Allen, who earlier in 1807, witnessed uh, when they dug down into, when they were digging the foundations of a certain site, they found all these inscriptions and an absolutely massive skeleton, which is 11 feet and four inches tall. And they even depicted it in this piece of art. You can see that here. Again, what happened to the skeleton? What happened to these inscriptions is unknown. In the area of Old Gaul, uh, going into France and uh, other areas, with this, this is a particularly interesting account. It could be the real smoking gun um, of uh, proving that most certainly European giants existed. This is a place called Castlenow, which is on the south coast of um, it's, it's on the south coast of France, going into the Mediterranean. And there's a huge mound there. And in 1890, some huge bones were discovered. They were examined by Professor Keener, uh, who admitted that the giant in question, when they analyzed the bones and measured them correctly, found that it must have been 11 foot 6 inches tall. Now, this is only one example, one human being, but these bones are still in Montpellier University and we're making inquiries as we speak to try and get hold of them and uh, get some analysis done on them. But again, this is completely covered up. No one is interested, um, but the research is there. And this just shows you uh, the analysis of the bones. This is a standard size human bone. This is the one <laughs> found at uh, Castle No. That's just the tip of the iceberg in ancient France. Also in ancient France, especially the Brittany area and the Mayenne area, we find huge megalithic sites, huge mounds, some of the largest stones ever moved and constructed and erected in that country uh, were in France. So we, we know that there was a serious um, case of megalithomania happening in that country, and it may have well be due to these 11 foot six tall people. In Tenerife, uh, we have examples. This was actually um, uh, from the early um, 1900s, and they potentially found a 14-foot tall giant there, and uh, in in a grave. This was like a, obviously one of the um, tribal leaders. But there's a tribe called the Guanche. I went over there recently, actually, to investigate this, and there's actual black stone pyramids there, a whole bunch of them in various parts of the country. And there's a tribe called the Guanche who were not interfered with until the Spanish came in the 1500s, and they lived a Stone Age lifestyle up until this period. And they mummified the dead, just like the Egyptians, uh, with embalming and other such techniques. They often had red hair, which is another trait we find with many of these giants. And one of them found was 14 feet tall. Other ones were routinely seven foot tall. So how did they get these traits and where did they originally come from? We find the same thing in Turkey, a place called um, near, basically not too far from uh, Hattusa. Uh, and we find seven foot warriors discovered. This is actually a polygonal wall, not too far from there, a place called Elajahoyak. Um, and we find these at Hattusha as well. And these are, these are Hittite sites, apparently, but they could be much older. And there was this uh, previous culture called the Hattians, who may well have been giants. Sardinia, uh, JJ and I have visited here twice because we're so obsessed by this country. Uh, I did an entire lecture about this at the recent Megalithomania conference. There's some of the most impressive megalithic sites I've ever seen. Uh, there's a whole type of site called the Giant's Graves or the Giant's Tombs. And there's about 60 or 70 of, the, 70 of these left. And there's accounts like this one on the bottom right of uh, giant eight foot skeletons being found on the north coast. Uh, and it's got s these Naraji towers were thought to be built by giants. These are the, the classic kind of Giant's Graves. And we have other sites, which we haven't been to this one. Um, but we have these accounts and there's stories that 
and there's, there's TV, several TV shows have been done on this, claiming that local families and farmers have been finding giant bones on their land, lands for hundreds of years. So again, it's worth going to these places and investigating them yourself because it's remarkable. In Japan, um, at Osaka, we have amazing sites there. We have like, you know, these dolmens, huge megalithic dolmens, just like we find in Europe. Massive stone walls, polygonal style. Um, this is from 1918. And again, we find seven foot tall skeletons. And we find one of the things we keep finding, which we, f we couldn't believe we're finding these in Japan, um, de decayed teeth are not found. The bony structure of the skeletons are massive. So they're not talking about thin basketball players you know, who are really stretched tall. These are genuinely the same proportions as normal human beings, but just larger in every dimension. Uh, the shimbos in most cases are somewhat flat. Some of these skeletons are seven feet high, even shorter ones are over six feet. And so that's just, we notice the anatomic anomalies here. We notice the perfect teeth. This is something we keep finding in relation to these giant skeletons and also these overly massive jaws. And what we'll find in North America and in some other places around the world, they often had double rows of teeth. This is one of the weirdest things uh, we've come across, but this is um, certainly a phenomenon. We, we, we commit a whole chapter to that in the book, uh, Giants on Record. Uh, even in uh, China, there's mummified uh, remains of fair-skinned, uh, red-haired people. There's pyramids there, there's dolmens, and these uh, mummies that were found were about seven feet tall. Uh, no one knows where they came from, apart from there are clues that they may have come from Scotland because they found some tartan um, uh, cloth in with some of the burials, which matches one of the tribes in ancient Scotland. This is the weirdest thing, considering these are about 6,000 years old. And then we have this ridiculous giant footprint um, with me and Michael Tellinger there. And I just wanted to show you, uh, compare it to my foot, it's the scientific analysis here. Um, and that's how big it is. It's about four and a half to five feet long. It's on the Swaziland, South Africa border. Uh, and apparently it's nine million years old and it's of a woman. Um, it's not a male foot, it's got six toes and you can see where the, the, the foot is pressed in and lifted up. You have this kind of part here. It's almost like when you pull out of like, you know, mud, you leave this overhang of um, the thing you've just stepped in. Um, and that's there. But the problem is, is that it's ridiculously big. So either it's someone with massive feet, a clown or something, or it's actually a genuine footprint, or it could have been carved even. Some people think it's actually carved because it looked a bit like a footprint and, they've, and they, were, they were making some kind of, um, you know, uh, something about the giants in the area or something. I'm not too sure, but it's in granite, so it's virtually impossible that this could have formed with a footprint. So we, the, the, the jury's still out on this. Michael and I want to believe this is a real giant footprint, but we're not too sure. But we have uh, in South Africa, not too far from there, 10 feet tall skeletons were unearthed. That wouldn't account for the footprint, obviously. But there are reports from that area. Uh, in Peru, there's actual eight foot tall um, giants were uncovered going into the Amazon area. They were actually witnessed being alive, often with red hair again, something we keep finding the more we look into this. And even at Tiwanaku in Bolivia and the, the famous Puma Punku site, there's reports and legends of um, the great god Viracocha, who was the pre-Incan god who emerged on Lake Titicaca and created a race of giants made of stone to create all the megalithic sites along the whole um, sacred valley, what was called the path of Viracocha. And he created them and they built all these sites. He got them to build them, he instructed them. And then he had to kill them off because they became cannibals. They were attacking people, they were eating people, which is um, a bit rude. And, um, and he had to destroy them. And the only way he could destroy them was with a flood. And so this, I couldn't believe it when I, I looked into the old records in ancient Peru and, fa and Bolivia and found that almost exactly matches the same traditions as what we find in the Bible, where the Gregory or the Watchers mate with human women and create the giant race called the Nephilim. And then they 
were building all the sites. They knew all the arts and sciences, megalithic construction. They were builders, geometers, um, herbalists, and uh, astronomers. And they were brilliant people, but they got out of hand. They became cannibals, and they kind of um, tried to depart from the main group. And again, God had to destroy them with a flood, and that was the Great Flood. And so we find the same parallels in different parts of the world. that people like Graham Hancock and others have reported and written about but now we're finding it is the same with the giants. Australia, um, there's numerous accounts here. I'm just going to run through these fairly quickly because um, um, originally this had 5,000 accounts in it, but I'm not going to go through them all. But this is uh, just an example of a seven-foot skeleton, uh, and it seems that the uh, Aborigines, or more correctly, Origines, the local people like to uh, call them, is um, they were very tall in some parts of the country. This is from 1929, this account. Uh, this is um, an example of some huge implements that were found all over uh, Australia. This is Rex Gilroy holding it. He's a brilliant alternative researcher in um, Australia, in New South Wales. Uh, we have a giant tooth here. It must have been from someone between 10 and 12 feet tall. We have elongated skulls found uh, that were very, very large, going back potentially to 13,000 years old. And if we move into New Zealand and the, uh, the Pacific, we find footprints, we find accounts, and they go on and on and on. And this is a place called Kiribati where the footprint has six toes. Now, why this is interesting is because we find this anatomic anomaly in several of the accounts, not only in North America, we find it in Ireland with the, the Irish giant, the 12 foot giant, has one, one of the feet it had six toes, but also in the Bible, they talk about this as well. Um, a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in all. And so we do find this, these kind of same traits occurring in different parts of the world. This is a place called Namadol in um, Micronesia on the island of Pompeii. This is an amazing place I'm determined to visit here one day because it's made of huge basalt columns, like a city built partly underwater. But the thing is, in 1859, um, they found um, an extremely large um, series of bones of gigantic size. And here's a little clip I'm going to play you from the Search for the Lost Giants TV show, which gives um, a little indication of what we're dealing with here. Hi, Jim. How you doing? Okay. My neighbor, Al Parapan, waves me down, and he tells me that he has a cautionary tale for me. I heard that you were looking into the giant thing. Yes, sir. I'd like to talk to you about Dan Medal and their giants. Oh, yeah. In the mid-'70s, I happened to be teaching school out there, and I was warned that you do not take anything from Dan Medal. The ancient city of Nan Madal lies off the far-flung Pacific island of Ponape in Micronesia. Its imposing stone walls rise up out of the ocean, and to this day, its construction remains shrouded in mystery. The local legends whisper of a lost civilization, ancient giant kings, and a fearsome curse that would strike down anyone who disturbed their spirits. But in 1907, ruling governor Victor Berg dared to ignore the warnings. The governor went to Nan Medal and dug out a giant burial ground and uh, died the next day. We're not in Nan Medal here. However, I think that uh, the warning should be heeded. Much heeded, thank you very much. Well, not really that well he did actually because um, we keep searching for giants and uh, we actually have a whole uh, chapter in the book called Curse of the, Gi of the Giant Hunters, uh, which is worrying somewhat, um, where several people who've actually done this, this is in North America as well, have actually either disappeared, they've gone mad or they've died. So um, please pray for me. Thank you. Uh, even in Patagonia, this is one of the most interesting areas when we're looking at modern giants, because even up to the early 1900s, um, eyewitness accounts of various navigators who went down to this area from the 1500s to the 1900s have uh, witnessed these. These are some artistic illustrations. This is the bottom tip of South America, basically, the uh, uh, Chilean Argentina, uh, I believe. And um, 
and numerous people, even Sir Francis Drake went down there and he witnessed seven to eight foot tall giants, Magellan and various other Spanish sailors. And there was a real kind of movement of giantology in the early to mid 1500s, which even stretched into Britain at the time because of Sir Francis Drake uh, witnessing these giants. Also at that time, North American giants were being witnessed by early explorers. We'll get into that more uh, in detail shortly. Um, but this was taken in 1901, this photo, and that's uh, Captain Frederick Cook, who did his famous voyage around this whole area between Patagonia and Antarctica. Now, there's this big hoo-ha about pyramids in Antarctica being discovered and photographed relatively recently, but whether there were pyramids there or not, there were most certainly giant races living in this area at least a thousand years ago, and probably much, much earlier. And so we have to really question, you know, what is going on? You know, is there an actual continent under here? Is it actual land mass? There is proof of this. Some people even say Atlantis is under here, uh, which is something my uh, co-author Jim Vieira is slightly obsessed by. Um, but in North America, this is what we're going to look at now, because this is the most weird and interesting place. If you're l interested in ancient sites, giants, elongated skulls, and other ancient mysteries, you wouldn't think that, would you? You'd think North America didn't have these kind of things to consider. This is a graphic I put together for an article uh, of the top 10 giants um, in North America, just showing you a variation and grading in height from my height around six foot all the way up to this one account we have of an 18 foot giant found in West Hickory, um, which is in Pennsylvania. So that, we're not too sure if that was a slight exaggeration or not, but certainly one's up to about 10 or 11 feet, most certainly potentially real. These are just a handful of the accounts we've collected from town and county histories, newspapers, academic journals, uh, diaries and personal journals of doctors uh, and lawyers and politicians and other people who dug these bones up for themselves when they first arrived in North America from the, well, from the 1500s, but mainly from the 1700s to 1800s onwards. Uh, the Smithsonian, you can see them mentioned here, um, 11 feet tall skeletons, tribes found, and so on and so forth. Here's a map, an early map that was put together by Cecilia Hall. And you can see her a blog here. I do recommend people uh, befriend her on Facebook. Uh, but she's been doing some brilliant maps for us and I want to credit her with this because she's helped us kind of piece it together in this Google Earth world. Uh, and you can see, you can just basically see how they, they really get ridiculous here around this area. You've got the Ohio Valley, you've got the Kanawha Valley uh, in Ohio and West Virginia. That's where the real intense amount have been found, which uh, is compelling. But also, we find, you know, some of the ones down here on, uh, in California, especially going on to the, the Channel Islands, Catalina Island and St. Nicholas and so forth, some of the uh, skeletal remains and discoveries there go back to between 10,000 and 40,000 years ago. It, it, there's actual evidence now of human occupation in that area 40,000 years ago. There's evidence we found in New Jersey, uh, up in this area, and also in different parts of California and uh, Nevada and Utah, over 100,000 years ago. They found skeletons and bones going back to this particular time. This is something we feature in the very final chapter in our book, called the, uh, the chapter called Origins of the Tall Ones. And there seems to be much more going on in North America than people realized. And we even have to um, credit Geoffrey of Monmouth in the history of the Kings of Britain, where he kind of mentions, you know, you know, Ross Hamilton sent this to me. Uh, I was aware of this quote because I've read, I've read that book several times. Uh, but he believes this is a description of America. Um, Beyond the realms of Gaul, beneath the sunset, lieth an island girt about by ocean, guarded by ocean, erst the haunt of giants. Now, if that is North America, that would be interesting, but it may not be because it's not exactly the description. But we have people like uh, Sir Francis Drake, who in 1578, he met some Patagonians, but he also, um, in his uh, journal that became a book written by his nephew, which came out in 1628, um, uh, he basically sailed all the way around South America and up the coast of California, probably to probably the area 
of uh, San Francisco, where he went on to land to um, get his boats fixed, rest up, get supplies and so forth, and he met a tribe of giants. Um, and also, you know, uh, Magellan, the Spanish explorer, also witnessed these giants from this area and commented on their strength of body, size, and hideousness of their voices. This is actually what happened to Sir Francis Drake. When he arrived, they were in such chaos and uh, confusion. They, didn't, they weren't the smartest of people, the, this, this race of giants in California. They tried to make him their leader. And so he kind of had to go along with it, so they would give him all the supplies required for them to continue on their uh, world-encompassed uh, journey. And so he became the king of this, this tribe. <laughs> this, is all, this is all in his uh, diaries, and you can actually read it yourself online. And it's one account. He got really into this. And, and like I said, that during the 1500s, there were um, a lot of stories and a whole wave of giantology, like this happening in this last decade or so, was happening around the world at that time. Before that, in 1519, um, France, for Ferdinand Magellan, he witnessed uh, various uh, giants in different areas. Alonso Alvarez de Pineda, he was mapping the Gulf, uh, the Gulf Coast area um, for Spain because he wanted to make it a Spanish colony. Um, and he found, he went down the Mississippi rivers and various different rivers. Uh, he found many native villages, but he also quickly discovered that there were giants and pygmies living along the rivers. And he reported this, matter of fact, sent it back to Spain. Um, and he t they had to get repairs done on their ships as well. He found gold uh, and various different things, but he described the exact height of some of these giants as uh, 11 palms in height, from 10 to 11 palms in height. And if we translate that into the modern measurement system, it was at, at least six foot seven to eight feet tall, depending on what size palm you use. And so, th so we have these accounts, matter of fact, written in the diaries of these Spanish explorers traveling up the rivers in the early 1500s, meeting giants and pygmies. Very strange. Um, we have um, some amazing stories of Spanish explorers having to battle with different tribes of giants as they went inland. Uh, they were kidnapping some of the giant tribal leaders, taking them back, then great wars would break out, there was all this deception and murder. It would be a great movie. Uh, so if you, we've got a whole chapter called um, just Early Explorers, and it's so fascinating, some of the stories uh, they come up. But the descriptions, they're very tall, well-formed. They were, some accounts talk about uh, they were doing head flattening, they were cannibals, some of them, they were tattooing. Um, and one particular tribe that was witnessed by Panida uh, was quite, quite amazed actually, um, because um, the, the Span other Spanish people who got there would, would often attack and abuse these, these, uh, these tribes, but some of them treated them really well and were remembered. Uh, as being quite nice, but others weren't. Now, this is another really strange uh, account, which um, this is uh, from the Caribbean islands, uh, written in 1523 by a historian, Peter Marta, who assisted at the Council of the Indies. And uh, there was a certain giant that was Christianized and taken to Spain. And a report ran that the natives were white and their king and queens were giants whose bones, while babies, had been softened with an ointment of strange herbs and then kneaded and stretched like wax by masters of the art, leaving the poor objects of their magic half dead until they, after repeated manipulations they finally attained their great size. So there we have it. That's how giants are created. But this is strange. So you get these kind of stories, um, but then you have the sort of matter-of-fact accounts as well. It's very bizarre. Um, yeah, and this just shows you the various uh, Spanish explorers, all these different people, Coronado, De Vaca, all of these different people, uh, in different parts, all in California, the Missis Mississippi River, you've got the, uh, oops, you've got the, um, crikey, sorry. Uh, all, yeah, it's just a ridiculous amount. I'm not going to go into them all now. I don't really have time, but we know that there's a Duhair tribe in the Carolinas. They were witnessed uh, in, the in the 1520s. 
uh, and they were kind of European looking, but they were giants with beards, red hair, dark hair. They looked, and so they weren't, and so the, 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 first, the Spanish explorers couldn't believe what they were seeing. And they had all these connections with Ireland, so potentially Irish travelers had come over. We get into this in the book, uh, obviously, in much more detail. Even Captain John Smith, in the early 1600s, uh, they kind of created Virginia or named it as Virginia. Uh, after the Queen at the time, the Susquehannocks were the tribe in, in Chepes, Chepes, Chesapeake Bay. Oh, got these words. Um, yes, in in this part of North America, basically. So we're looking at um, the the eastern part of America, and they witnessed seven to eight foot tall giants. And actually, in this map, this is a giant, and here it says it describes a giant, you know, giant-sized uh, tribal leader. In New England, uh, we find the same thing. Um, it's a place I've researched with Jim Vieira. He lives up, he loves, lives up in uh, Ashfield, Massachusetts. These are the old tribal names of this area. Um, it's really this river here is probably the most important one because all along this river, the Connecticut River, we find um, examples of uh, tribes living by the river, obviously for the water, the fresh fish, and so forth. And most of the accounts are kind of along this, but you can see them here. Most of the accounts from New England seem to be associated uh, with good fishing places, and entire villages and towns ruled by giants were discovered there, and all the traditions and stories uh, back this up. We even find dolmens. This is actually on um, uh, one of the islands uh, just off uh, the coast there, and you, see f you find classic dolmens there. It's, it's really, quite, really quite something. Um, Martha's Vineyard, that is. This is a place called, um, I think, Cannon Rock, or called Phaeton Rock, and it was uh, reported on in 1859 as like a hanging rock or a dolmen. Uh, and interestingly, in this, not too far from there, if we head a bit further north, um, Passaconway was a chief of the Penacook tribe, and he was the last kingly um, sachem or chief, but he became what's called a Bashaba, chief of chiefs. and. He lived to 120 years old, uh, and he was said to be between seven and eight feet tall, uh, living in the 1600s. So he was trying to create peace, because there was wars going on all throughout New England at this time, um, between um, the different tribes. And interestingly, right next to where, he's, where his reservation was, because uh, there was actually a stone circle has been found, which I couldn't believe when I, I witnessed this. And this was actually recorded, recorded in the 1800s and the 1600s as well as having existed. So it's very intriguing that you start finding megalithic sites linked with these giants, even in North America. There's even megalithic chambers, um, which we find similar style all over Europe, obviously, but we find them very much so, all over, hundreds of them, all over New England. I've written a, quite an extensive article about this, and we feature this in a couple of chapters in the book. If we look at Connecticut, for instance, this area on the south coast here, New Haven, this is the area um, of interest here. There's Yale University in that area with the Skull and Bone Society <coughs> and um, various other areas, but there's connections there because we're finding the Peabody Museum in New Haven, Connecticut. In 1904, uh, some extremely large skeletons were uncovered, and they were written about and reported in the journals and in the newspapers. Um, this is actually near Hartford. This is along the Connecticut River again. An entire town was written about in 1901. Um, and various, uh, you know, the th basically one of the quotes is, the thigh bone of the giant skeleton is twice as large as that of an ordinary man. Now this is being completely built over by Hartford City now, this is like the capital of Connecticut. And, but you find the same stories, the same principles all the way up the Connecticut River. And the just list goes on, we have a petrified giant that was discovered, that was eight feet long. Um, this was, um, discovered in the early 1800s. And when we were recording the show, we based ourselves at Jim's office, which was called um, basically the, the Giant's office. Um, um, and I've got another little video I want to show you, which is uh, just looking at uh, some research we were doing up in um, this part of the country. Meanwhile, 
50 miles due north. We're going to try to hit a couple of places in Rockingham. Jim and team member Hugh Newman are hunting for a giant skeleton reportedly unearthed 160 years ago, but which eventually vanished. I wanted to look into town history, Rockingham, Vermont, 1907. Jim is hoping obscure town records will help them track down the discovery made along the Connecticut River, just outside of Rockingham, Vermont. So this is the site in question. This area right here. So in 1849, they built the Cheshire Railroad here. And when they uncovered the ledges right above there, they found something they didn't expect. The workers were busy with the arduous task of building the Cheshire Railroad line through hills that were so rocky that blasting was required. While clearing away debris, the men unwittingly uncovered a Native American burial ground. One of the skeletons was unique. They exhumed a native chief of giant stature. The skeleton was not only giant, but possessed other unique anatomic attributes as well. He was noted to have a massive jawbone that could fit over the face of the finder, and double rows of teeth. From there, we don't know what happened to it. It's an open mystery right now. We know it came from here. Now it's like a post-industrial wasteland. And just across the river, another clue. There's a petroglyph site on the other side. Right there, see? Oh, yeah. So you can see like a dozen of these round faces with antenna-like projections coming out of them. Discovered in the 1800s, the carvings are believed to be hundreds or perhaps even thousands of years old. Some say they were carved by members of an indigenous people, the Abenaki, to ward off evil spirits or to commemorate a bloody battle that took place near the river long ago. But there's another theory. Although many of the petroglyphs have been destroyed or worn away, earlier sketches depict additional skull-like symbols, larger than the rest, and possessing details that resemble protruding teeth. So the question we need to find out is where are the bones now? Okay, we're looking for the Rockingham Town Library. Jim and Hugh head to the library in hopes that the records housed there will verify the existence of the skeleton and perhaps shed light on what became of it. Okay, so that just gives you a little clip. You were really getting into that, weren't you? All the music and everything. So that gives you a little clip. Just to see, This is how we actually do it. We don't have you know a film crew and cool music following us around everywhere, but this is how we go and investigate. We go into the libraries, we look through the old records, we talk to people, we find evidence. With this case, this continued. We found written evidence of giants with double rows of teeth being discovered in Rockingham, Vermont. We then find out where the family lived that you know, where the, the bones and the skeleton ended up. They were actually on display in a doctor's office in the street, in the middle of the street. We found the doctor's office, we found the glass window where this eight foot tall skeleton was on display. It had been removed by NAGPRA in 1990. We'll get onto that shortly. This is where a lot of these disappear. This is the uh, petroglyphs in question. And this, this is the strange teeth. Uh, <laughs> Very large skull here compared to all the, well, I don't know what these antennas are and all that kind of stuff, ancient aliens, etc. But this has got the really weird depiction of teeth here. So we're questioning whether that was one of the earliest depiction of one of these anatomic anomalies, these double rows of teeth. But anyway, let's move slightly west from there and head into New York State. Now, this whole area is fascinating. Um, not New York City really, but New York State, we have some very, it's the most eastern part of the mound culture sites. You don't really get anything much further east apart from the shell mounds on the coast of uh, Maine and Vermont. But these are where the earthen mound culture really finished. But in these mounds, numerous giant skeletons have been uncovered. Here's just uh, one example from uh, 
uh, Syracuse. This is from 1849, uh, sorry, 1819. Uh, and this was the diary of Victor Hopkin, Hopkins Clark. And he was um, talking about skeletons of extraordinary size were found, the skulls were comparatively large, uh, and again, the jaws were surrounded with a full set of double teeth all around. They were perfectly sound teeth, covered with a beautiful enamel of the most perfect whiteness. Again, we're finding these anatomic traits. We find a similar description in the same area here. Uh, double row of teeth in each jaw, uh, those of a man of colossal size. Um, and often, the problem with the way they buried these people is that when they were exposed to air, and you can see that in the last yellow quote there, they often crumbled to dust. Now, so the skeptics would have us believe that that means, oh, they're just making it up then because there's no evidence. But there's too many of these accounts. And these accounts are not in sensational front page New York Times, um, you know, on the front of these newspapers. They're hidden in these old town and county journals, these old books that only l eight people will ever read in uh, the history of the world. That they're not sensational, they're hidden at the back in the footnotes of these ancient books that we have been going through for the last seven or seven or so years. And this is how we're finding this stuff. It's quite, it's quite amazing. We have some brilliant researchers working with us um, that help us do this as well. Again, we find, uh, this is from 1854, this is, a, this is a, a, the most obscure book probably on the planet, A History of Jefferson County, 1854. Uh, again, we find double rows of teeth, a large maple tree was dug up and the bones of a man of great stature were uncovered. This guy was so uh, inspired by what he saw when he was a kid, again, New York State, he um, called Charles Huntington that when he, you know, he saw a nine foot, male and seven foot female uh, unearthed when he was a kid. So he eventually got so excited by this that when he was an adult, he decided to make these wooden models that are on display in, in a private museum. Um, it doesn't prove they were real, but he, was, he, he wanted to sort of put it in the historical record that this was a real discovery. This is the actual, one of the early accounts from the time when this was actually unearthed. If we head uh, into Pennsylvania, and uh, towards the Ohio Valley, um, it starts getting more and more intense. But um, here we have this area. So this is where we've just been. I mean, you can see the, the thicket of giant accounts here and how it gets more intense. There's not too much in this area, but I, I don't know where to go next, really. But I'm going to show you one more clip because I want to introduce you. This is the last clip we're going to see. This I want to introduce you to uh, Ross Hamilton. Now, Ross Hamilton is, we call him the godfather of giantology. So that is his name. If you ever meet Ross Hamilton, you have to call him the godfather of giantology, please. He, he will laugh out loud. Um, and he is one of the main researchers. He wrote the classic book called A Tradition of Giants that everyone ignored, everyone ridiculed him. He wrote it about 15 or 20 years ago. No one took it seriously. So we've been championing him because he's helped us. He's just been so selfless so brilliant um, and he's been uh, collecting all the accounts from the Ohio Valley and piecing together this lost historical timeline. He even took the time to speak with a Native American, the surviving Native American elders such as Vine Deloria and Jake Swamp and others and collected the oral histories and the folklore and the stories that of actual you know ancient Native Americans witnessing and interacting with these giants. So the last clip but you have to you have to check this out and meet Ross Hamilton. Meanwhile, they have decided to meet with a fellow expert in the field of giant research, Ross Hamilton. Ross is the godfather of giantology. I trust him, that's yeah. for sure, you know. Ross lives in the heart of mound builder country, and he's written extensively about the history and folklore of giants. He learned so much information from native elders. And he's taken all this oral tradition and historical evidence and has synthesized the story. So I have uh, kind of a surprise for you guys. Ross has been studying the phenomenon of giant skeleton finds for two decades, but he has a new theory that he's about to reveal for the first time to Jim and Bill. What do we got here? Well, this is uh, one of my prized possessions. This is a map of the mounds as they were known to the Smithsonian in the late 19th century. Every one of these uh, red dots represents uh, some major group of mounds for the native people. 
We found many accounts of people with very tall stature throughout everywhere these earthworks were. And this will blow your mind a little bit. One time there was a great nation, and this country extended from the Hudson Bay all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And they were called the Alihana. I have to admit, uh, when Ross first started talking about Asteris, I was skeptical. It's pretty crazy stuff. And we're going back to the Middle Archaic period, perhaps as long as 6,000 years ago. Ross just blew our mind. He's telling us that he believes that the real story goes back over 6,000 years. They had a single ruler, and they even had a single language, perhaps with letters, that was all swept away in prehistory. According to Ross, the civilization left behind by this Alihana people produced the mounds, which to this day are one of the wonders of the ancient world. North America's answer to the pyramids, Machu Picchu, and Stonehenge. These structures have been demonstrated by scientists to accurately predict the solstice and the equinox. Ross believes this same civilization may have been founded by a royal class of colossi. They were the true giants. And it was they who had the empire that stretched far to the west and all the way to the east coast. Taking all that in, if you step back from it, the figure that's represented is in the shape of like the American Eagle. You can see it. <laughs> now that you say it, absolutely. If what Ross is saying is true, this civilization may be the key link between the Goshen Mystery Tunnel and the Mound Builders. This part is fascinating. People of tall stature were considered to be an executive class. And they were the ones that we believe were revered like they were gods. The idea of a race of giant rulers has haunted the mind of mankind since the dawn of recorded history, like the titans of Greek mythology, royal spawns of gods and mortals, Atlas, who held the world on his shoulders, Prometheus, who brought fire to the human race. But could these fantastic names be dim echoes of a lost race of gigantic rulers who may also have towered over Ross's civilization of the eagle. This makes the picture so much clearer, it really does. The idea of unusually tall, royal class buried in mounds, it really resonates. So this idea of a royal class of giants is something that Ross has been very focused on and, and it makes a lot of sense and he, um, he provided some original uh, research, actually, that he allowed, he wanted us to put in the book. He wrote the foreword to our book. He he was edited it. He was like the big the big inspiration to make this happen. So I want to just give him a huge praise and credit. He's also written some fantastic books on Serpent Mound and other sites in the area. Now the, the problem with Ohio is that there are too many accounts. Uh, it's just ridiculous that as the settlers were moving in in the 16, 17, 1800s, and they were digging out the mounds. Um, they were finding so many bones, thousands of them, often like there were piles of bones and skulls shoved into mounds. And then they were uh, even like, there were other burials later on top of the mounds. And some of the burials, you, you must understand, were like 60 feet below the ground surface. And then the mound was built on top. Not all of them, but some were. And we've got some accounts of that. We also have, uh, the, there's oral tradition from people like Vine Deloria, that they were indeed, um, breeding between themselves. There was like a, like a breeding program between the elite giants. They often had their own villages next to the main towns where all the commoners would live. But this is something we find all over North America, going way up to even up to the 15, 1600s, before they were decimated by disease uh, and the European explorers. But Serpent Mound is a, a very interesting place. If you're gonna be in North America, you kind of have to visit. It's probably the primary site in North America. Um, it's well protected. Uh, Ross is often there giving lectures and talking to people about it. It's uh, 1,370 foot long. Um, and there's evidence now that um, radiocarbon dating has put it back to at least 300 BC, but there's other dating which has put it back to over 1,000 BC. So we're looking at different eras here. But uh, Frederick Putnam, he was the main um, excavator here in 1891. 
and um, he this was photographed during one of his excavations and this was released as a postcard um, in the late 1800s and it clearly states skeleton of mound builder seven feet in length serpent mound peebles ohio on a postcard in the late 1800s so that when jeffrey wilson who's ross's friend is also a brilliant researcher uncovered this we, we were just blown away so we had to include this in the book so there's some genuine photographs like this that we can rely on when we're looking into this um, strange world of giantology. Another site not too far from there is the Marietta Earthworks. These are a remarkable series of earthworks and mounds in a geometric form. Um, it's thought to be a Hopewell site around 100 or so BC, but it could be much older. Um, uh, and there's huge earthwork squares, which are one and a half thousand feet wide. This is what's remaining of it. There's me looking silly in my scout shorts um, when I was investigating there a few years ago. And it's actually, funnily enough, they build a graveyard around an ancient grave site, just to confuse me. Um, and this has giant burials have been found here as well. This is what it looked like. But um, in 1901, some taller than average skeletons were discovered in the earthworks that were at least seven feet tall. Not huge, but consistent that there was like a consistent race of people who were at least seven feet tall, going to eight feet, nine feet, and even 10, 11 feet, all over this part and spread out through the whole of North America. This is a particularly interesting one from 1903. Um, this, they found an eight foot or so skeleton buried deep beneath the ground, but in there they found this small jar of corn. And when they actually, uh, they went, they thought, well, we'll try and plant and see what comes up. And they planted this corn and got some results. And this corn that grew was much more abundant and strong than the corn that the, uh, the settlers were growing at the time. So we have more evidence that they were certainly advanced and they were working with agriculture going back into prehistory, something we get into in the book because I'm not going to get into it too much here, but they were, they were working with the natural earth energies. They were even working you know, with the, the rain and the lightning and other things to charge up certain mounds, to fertilize the landscape and using it for ceremonial and ritualistic purposes too. If we head uh, into West Virginia, this is another hub of giants. The whole Kanawha Valley, something that Andrew Collins, has become, has become, a friend of mine, has become very interested in, has been researching. But I, I visited um, this particular mound. This is absolutely amazing. This is Grave Creek Mound, in Moundsville, of all places, um, in West Virginia. And it was here they found this particular, um, they didn't only find some eight foot skeletons and some royal burials, but they found this very interesting tablet which has now gone missing unfortunately but someone made some copies of it and Barry Fell who was a Harvard, um, a Harvard guy who kind of um, studies all the different symbols and languages uh, he pronounced this as basically Phoenician or Canaanite from the Bible lands and so we find in this connection in the mounds with giants connecting the potential the Nephilim the watchers the early biblical accounts evidence of them in North America, which is one of the things that the Christian giantologists absolutely love. And, but we, d we are finding that this is the case. We're finding connections between these great cultures. Um, on my trip, this is the only giant skeleton I managed to witness. Uh, this is the one at uh, the Muta Museum in Philadelphia. Seven foot six, found in northern Kentucky. Uh, in the eight, late 1800s. Uh, the problem is we think this one has gigantism acromegaly, so we don't know if this is a mound builder or whether they've messed around with it to make it look like it's got acromegaly or what. We're not too sure. No tests have been done on this, but when I looked into the records at the museum, I did find that the discoverer who gave it to the museum ref said, look, you can have this, but you cannot tell anyone where you got it from um, or where it was uncovered exactly and left it at that. So whoever gave it to them didn't want them to know some information, which is intriguing nonetheless. Ah, Arkansas. The Giants, uh, there's some very interesting sites up in this area. Um, we have the Chickasauba Mounds, where these were basically, there was a whole huge amount of um, 
excavation, if you want to call it that, or more like obliteration, uh, in the 1800s. And numerous reports came forth because this was like a this was like a giant town or city, and skeletons between eight feet and ten feet tall were uncovered and reported. There was even one hanging around in one of the tents they put up when they were excavating that was just lying there. This eight foot giant skeleton was lying there for weeks, and then suddenly one day it, go, it was gone. So whether it walked up and it had enough and walked away, or whether it was stolen, we don't know. But this is this is all that's left really of the Chickasaw Mounds. I went up there myself um, a couple of years ago. And um, even recently, in 1976, when they were digging the foundations of a nearby house, they found a seven foot six tall skeleton. And so a 29 inch femur was discovered, which would be of a skeleton eight feet tall, uh, extremely large jaws, um, very powerful cheekbones. Again, these are the traits we're finding all over North America and in different parts of the world. This is uh, from the Ozark Caves. Uh, which is sort of northwest Arkansas, uh, and this was given. This was report given and written about by the highly uh, regarded reporter at the time, Victor Schoffelmeyer, uh, and he was into the Rosicrucians and this whole New Age movement, which was happening in the early 1900s, and they found basically skeletons, if they pieced the bones together, which they discovered up there, that were 10 feet tall with deformed skulls. You can see some of the skulls there. So again. Jim and Bill Vieira, who were you know, stars of the TV show, who you saw up on the screen, they went to investigate this, but uh, unfortunately Beaver Dam is now being created and the whole area is being flooding. However, they did some dives uh, and they found some walls, some megalithic walls and some inscriptions in the area where they were supposed to have been um, originally found, but nothing else uh, was found there, unfortunately. Um, and uh, what is this? Yeah, this is just a, a follow-up to the report of the um, extremely tall skeletons. Yeah, in Oklahoma, I had a chance with JJ to visit the Spyro Mounds. I was very delighted. These are an amazing site, uh, which you can still visit. They've got a great uh, visitor center, a museum there. Um, and this was excavated and obliterated. Um, from 1933 until 1935. And this is quite rare in North America because you've got like a triple or quadruple mound set. Uh, this is like how they were excavating it and what they found within it uh, by the Pecola Mining Company. And um, they found amazing artifacts of stone, copper, shell, and fabrics, and other such things. Uh, and it was dubbed the King Tut, or King Tut of the Arkansas Valley in 1935, because so much was discovered there. But also, they found some giant skeletons. Of course they did. Um, why wouldn't you if uh, you're in North America? So among the finds uh, was an extremely large femur. It would have been someone about nine feet tall buried with normal sized people. So we're seeing this elites and then their helpers or whatever buried next to them. Something we do find uh, not only in North America but in different parts of the world. Uh, this one was seven foot tall um, and bound to be a giant. And this is just, I mentioned this already, this was where, when the giant actually went missing in 1936. I mean, they were just so blasé about finding eight foot skeletons that they just leave them lying around. And then they get stolen. And this is um, myself and Jim, we were investigating this, um, oh, I forget exactly where this was now, um, this was discovered in Illinois, um, the, these particular hammerheads or axe heads, which will, would have, you know, uh, wood and rope attached to them. One of them is 36 pounds, which I think is what, 20 kilos or so, uh, another one is 14 and a half pounds, and we witnessed these, we photographed them, we filmed them, and basically, um, this is Brock Smith, he's an artifact collector. Uh, who, met, who got in touch with us after we saw the TV show. And this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to giant artifacts, because you try and wield that size axe, just try it, it's, uh, you can barely lift it up. It's almost impossible, but these were found, some of these were found in the same places as the giant skeletons. Here's another huge axe, which is of a similar size, um, which was found in Missouri. It's quite a famous one. Uh, we have a whole chapter uh, looking at curious artifacts in the book and giant artifacts. But this is where the problem lies, deep within the Smithsonian files. There's me at the Smithsonian Institution um, back in uh, 2012 when I was researching the book. 
Now, I'm not going to give you a big history of the Smithsonian, except that it was founded uh, in the mid-1800s, and an English guy, uh, James Smithson, left the equivalent of about $13 million to America to create an institute um, uh, for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Now, that was a great idea at the time, um, and it basically consisted of 105,000 gold coins. But Congress decided to invest the money in the treasury bonds issued by the state of Arkansas. Uh, and the bonds became worthless and they defaulted and they lost all the money. But luckily, the government was charging everyone tax. So John Quincy Adams um, created that amount of money and the institution was then founded again. So there's a strange little story at the very beginning of the Smithsonian Institute where an English guy had never been to America wanted to found this amazing institution for the diffusion and increase of knowledge and it's actually become the opposite it's become the suppression and hiding of the knowledge as we'll see um, there was a public first publication was by Ephraim Squire and Edwin Davis and they went around before many of the settlers actually um, destroyed and, and looted uh, many of the mound sites, surveyed many of the sites and found ex extremely sophisticated geometry and astronomy and metrology hidden within many of these sites. Now, as we get into this, we'll, s we'll realize that the Smithsonian, even though it was a private institution, it wasn't regulated by the government or anything, was actually, um, everyone sent everything there. When discoveries were being made, everything was sent to the Smithsonian, or Smithsonian uh, s employees would go out and collect artifacts and bring them back. And one of the things they really wanted to do was collect any skulls and skeletons, especially skulls. And they did this, and they actually created teams of people going out to different parts of the country just to collect skulls and bones and uh, you know, priceless artifacts. And the problem is, they would take all these artifacts, never to be heard of again, never to appear in the museums, and never to appear in any of the annual journals. So this is the big problem that people have, because there's hundreds of accounts where they've um, sent them to the Smithsonian, they cook, they've got in touch with them a few months later and there's no record of it. And so they were covering up from a very early point, from a very early stage. Here's just a couple more examples um, where, um, you know, packed and forwarded to the Smithsonian Institution. The remains will be sent to the Smithsonian Institution, both never to be heard of again. Um, so we've got here uh, an ancient gun weighing 30 pounds. Very intriguing, uh, huge, you know, you know, precision cut stones and tombs, bones discovered. Absolutely incredible, the legacy of ancient North America, completely obliterated and covered up, which is so frustrating. This is a uh, good friend, Ailes Hudlitska. He is. Um, he became the head of basically the head of the Smithsonian in 1910 as the curator of the Division of Physical Anthropology. The problem with him, he was involved in the eugenics movement, a pre-Nazi philosophy founded by the Rockef Rockefeller Feder uh, Foundation, of, of all people. He often influenced and overpowered his contemporaries, and he was very much in the mood for like dismissing Native Americans, pushing them onto reservations. The whole um, agenda of manifest destiny became the norm. Evolution was being championed by Charles Darwin and his cronies. And, and it became a big problem. And this really is summarized quite neatly in uh, the brilliant book written by uh, J. Edgar Smoot about, um, about ancient America. And you can just look at it here, with land rights being one of the foremost issues facing lawmakers, having evolutionary theories that labeled the American Indian population as savage would be seen as a pivotal breakthrough in addressing and advancing a manifest destiny agenda, along with a host of other scientific, government, and social ethnological issues. And there's evidence of this, there's evidence of this agenda emerging and taking place. And one problem that kept occurring, they wanted the Native Americans to appear you know, savages, they wanted them to be pushed onto reservation. They wanted their land, basically. They wanted their treasures as well. And when you're finding 10-foot tall skeletons, sophisticated geometric earthworks, and incredibly precision carved artifacts, it doesn't fit with manifest destiny. And it doesn't, certainly doesn't fit with evolution. So this, is the, this was the problem in place. So there was like, it wasn't just one or two people doing this. There was an overriding 
um, group of people. These were all elites. Um, these were all very rich people. They were a lot of them were kind of linked with the Nazis and eugenics movement. They were measuring. Um, uh, the skull to see the intelligence. So they wanted, they, so that any small skull they found, or sort of a, a savage looking skull they called it, they would then present that and put that in the Smithsonian. When they kept finding skulls of 38 inch and 40 inch diameter, twice the size of my head, uh, they, weren't, they weren't presented, but they were recorded. That's the thing. Everything that went into the Smithsonian had accession records, and we have some of those that we're going to show you in a moment. Uh, again, just some more examples here that were found um, where they were going to be sent to the Smithsonian. Uh, huge jaws, unusually large, um, so on and so forth. I can't really go into this in detail. But there's two books that we, we bought um, for quite a large amount of money, the fifth and twelfth annual report from the eight, late 1800s um, are really the ultimate places to find giant accounts. The problem is, when they were writing these, um, it wasn't necessarily the, the main people um, involved in the Smithsonian putting these together. These were groups of people they sent out to collect the data, to dig the mounds and so forth. And the fifth, the fifth annual report, I think from the 1892 or something, had like 30 accounts of between seven and eight foot tall giants, large bones, teeth, artifacts. The twelfth annual report is amazing. It's like uh, an entire book of giantology. Um, and for some reason, everything's in there. But in the final concluding remarks that were written by the curators at the time, even though there was like, you know, something like 20 accounts, there's 12 really good ones and about another 15 interesting ones. We're talking about double and triple rows of teeth being found in Florida. We're talking about 40-inch uh, circumference skulls, massive jaws. The list goes on. And yet in the final concluding chapter, the conclusion, there's no mention of them at all which really baffled us. We read through it again and we were like, what? How could they not notice this? It's in their own book. Uh, and so what we have is we have, we have proof that they were discovering these things themselves, as well as all the other people that were discovering and, and put out a th over a thousand news reports in newspapers and other such um, publications. Um, and so it really does look like a major cover-up was going on, and, it's, and it hasn't really stopped. And then what the problem, the real problem that happened is that all of the bones and skulls and everything got disappeared completely because it didn't fit in with their theories. And then in 1990, just as people were starting to gain an interest in this subject again, there were certain skulls and bones and jaws on display all over America publicly, you know, but the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA, was, uh, I'm not saying that again, was, um, was created and put into force and it became law, federal law, between the American government and the Native American elders to create this thing where any grave goods and certainly any bones uh, of Native American origin were removed from public display and reburied, reinterred. We know where some of the bones were reburied, but if you go and dig that up, you will be put in prison for 10 years. There's a extremely strong, tight laws about this now in North America. So we had to be so careful when we were making the TV show, and even when we were publishing the book, we had to be really careful what we could and couldn't put in there, because they would come down on you hard, and you're breaking major laws, which you can go to prison for and be fined tens of thousands of dollars. And so, so th with that in place, and then before that, you've got the Smithsonian, you got to question what's going on here. Are they, are they genuine conspiracies? Are they cover-ups? Or are they just a series of agendas that were in place over the, the centuries, over the decades, that just manifested in no giant skeletons being left for us to research or DNA test? One of the interesting things, um, before we get into some strange uh, teeth that we're going to look at, is um, the idea that um, you know, um, oh God, let me think about this carefully. One of the ideas that kind of really shocked us and challenged us was this, you know, partly to do with these double rows of teeth, is the fact that the, the anatomic anomalies and the lack of access to like DNA samples, we tried to get DNA samples uh, and they, there was no way, no way you could get anything to test. And it became really, really frustrating. And do any, any of you know about Kennewick Man that was discovered up in Washington State? It's like a 10 or 11,000 year old um, skeleton that was discovered. Um, 
and other ones were discovered that old in, uh, in Nevada. And the Native Americans claimed ownership of it, so then it went into Nagpra law. But you can't really prove 10,000 years of um, DNA testing. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a moment, but I want to quickly run through. Um, so I'm getting a bit um, agitated by the Smithsonian currently. Um, but the double rows of teeth is one of the strangest anatomic anomalies we've come across. And we've, we've got an entire chapter devoted to this. And we have numerous accounts of them being recorded. I'm going to have to move through these fairly quickly. Um, but, you know, we have several accounts. We talked to Shara Bailey, who was a dental anthropologist at New York University, about this, and she was absolutely baffled. She'd come across supernumerary teeth, which is extra teeth in the mouth, in various, various uh, parts of her uh, kind of studies, but never ex such, you know, descriptions of double rows of teeth, because these were all taken away by the Smithsonian and by NAGPRA, unfortunately. Uh, we have more accounts here. Uh, one skull had two rows of teeth. This is... Um, just one of you know probably 50 accounts we have. Another very strange anatomic anomaly um, is horn skulls. This unfortunately, um, which is a pity, uh, ended up not being a real skull. This was reported as being a real skull found in Sayre, Pennsylvania, uh, in eight in the 1800s uh, in a in a mound group. But what we have got, we actually got five other accounts of horn skulls being found with these giants. And even pygmy skulls with horns um, found in Ohio. So the anatomic anomalies just get weirder and weirder. Obviously, we have the flattening of the skulls. These ones are uh, from North America. This one is actually from uh, near Tiwanaku, Pumapunku, in uh, Bolivia. But this, this, this has actually been stolen, <laughs> unbelievably. Um, but we know that the head flattening was something that was happening in the elongated skull, something Brian talked about a couple of years ago, was happening all over North America as well as Central and South America. And on the Californian Channel Islands, uh, most notably on um, Catalina Island, there's a huge amount of stories going back that describe giant skeletons being found. Amateur archaeologist Ralph Glidden started going over there uh, about 1919 to 1930 and discovered over three and a half thousand skeletons, some that were eight feet tall. And here's a more recent one of an elongated skull found on that island. And in 2012, um, uh, the curator, John Barangina, of the museum discovered this lost box and found photographs and accounts and stories of Glidden's discoveries. And he found more evidence of giant skeletons. And this is an analysis by L.A. Mazzurli of one that was discovered on uh, Catalina Island. But also on the other islands, we have giant accounts. This is San Nicolas Island. And also we have this on um, uh, other Channel Islands as well. San Miguel, San Bernardo, um, San Nicolas, all the different islands seem to have this going on. And we have basically dating that goes back to 8,000 years old at least, but we have human occupation because they found charcoal and fires going back 40,000 years. So this really questions what was really going on. This is uh, from um, one of the Channel Islands. This has been dated. These were seven foot skele skeletons dated to over 7,070 years old. So we know this is um, extremely ancient. We have Lovelock Cave in Nevada, where we have the famous Saiti Ka. Um, these were the red-haired, potentially cannibalistic giants who terrorized all their neighborhoods. And they were eventually destroyed by that Piuti tribe, um, uh, where they chased them all into Lovelock Cave and burnt them out and smoked them out until they all died. But the remains. Uh, do show some remarkable skulls and giant sandals and other such things that were discovered. But I'm just going to have a couple more minutes just, uh, just looking at the origins of the tall ones uh, before we close. There's some really interesting research is now coming out about where these giants really came from. I mean, one of the ideas which no one likes apart from me for some reason is this idea of that was put forward by a brilliant archaeologist called Jeffrey Goodman in the early 90s uh, called American Genesis he wrote a book with that title and he claims that speciation on planet earth didn't all happen 
in North Africa. It happened all over the world at the same time, going back at least 200,000 years, maybe millions of years. Now we look at the work of Michael Crimo uh, and the forbidden archaeology and the extreme antiquity of the human race. But if we look more closely to our era, there are stories of the Denisovans. This is a brilliant and amazing uh, bracelet made out of this precious stone found in the Denisovan caves in Siberia, which dates to at least 40,000 years ago, um, showing high technology. And we also found this bone pin as well found in the area. Now, why the Denisovans are interesting is because Denisovan DNA is found in over 3% of no no Native American civilization in, that in the entire country, three point, I think 3.4%. Uh, DNA has been found, so we know there's a Denisovan connection. And who these people were, no one really knows. But the only evidence we do have is that they were very tall, because we found some teeth there that were analysed, um, and they were found to be at least twice the chewing surface of our size teeth. There was also a very robust finger bone was found in the area. So the fact we're finding DNA in the area does suggest that the migrations probably happen something like this, where we're seeing um, a movement from the whole Denisovan area here, coming down this way, coming across the Pacific. And there's evidence of Australasia and Pacific DNA as well, coming into North America at least 40 to 50,000 years ago. And there's actual evidence for this now. There's also here, we have Homo heidelbergensis in Europe and in Africa. Now these are really interesting because these are the earlier people before the Denisovans. This is where the Denisovans came from, potentially, Homo heidelbergensis. Now, the interesting thing about this, and this is reported by Professor Francis Thackeray and Dr. Lee Berger of this university in South Africa, they were routinely over seven foot tall. The standard, the standard height was routinely over seven feet tall. But when Michael Tellinger, which I'm sure some of you are well, he interviewed Professor Francis Thackeray at the university, and they actually got hold of this bone and got him to admit on camera that this fossilized bone, which is probably at least 100,000, maybe 200,000 years old, was twice the size of a normal human being, at least 10 feet tall. And so we've got evidence now in the scientific record of giants existed potentially 150,000 years ago, right up to the Denisovan era of 40,000 years ago. And we know that their DNA is existent in the North American native populations. We also have this very strange thing, just, just one, one minute, Frank, and um, of, this is actually Frank on the right here, no, only joking. And um, so we have this very strange story of Cro-Magnon man, where 45,000 years ago, or roughly, uh, suddenly in Europe and this, this part of the world, um, they appeared in the human timeline. And this is who we're really descended from, who we're most similar to in the human time. We're not really like Neanderthals anymore. They appeared out of nowhere. And they were, originally, when they were being discovered, when they were being written about, the old books were talking about them, they were seven feet tall. Now, they were about six feet tall, according to Wikipedia and other institutions like that. So we're seeing a problem here. We're seeing a kind of a filtration of knowledge coming through the academic world, being spread out into um, television, you know, popular books and other such things. And this is very frustrating um, in one way, but we must remember not to take it all too seriously. Uh, because uh, there's more research to be done. We can't um, worry about it too much. We're all here, we're all alive, and we're all well. So thank you very much uh, for listening. It was... Uh a huge amount of research, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Seven years, you say? Uh, yeah, on and off, yeah, as well as megalithic research and yeah. other stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, any questions? Yes, uh, my name is Ole. Um, I want to ask about um, why <laughs> do they hide uh, this uh, science 
for us. I, I, I really don't understand why they are, are hiding this and why the Smithsonian uh, 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 did, did that. I have been into this before. Um, <clears throat> and my question would be something about um, the, the evolution that we learn today, that we're coming from the Big Bang and uh, we are spinning on a, a blue ball and all this, and, and we all made out of dust and all this. So, so what, what are your opinion to, to, um, to the evolution theory and Big Bang? Oh God. Um. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest question, the first one, isn't it? It's always yes. like this. Um, yeah. No idea. Next. <laughs> no. Um, what, well, I'm going to relate it to what I'm, I've studied and what I'm aware of, um, which is the giants and the, you know, things like this. I mean, um, well, the thing is, a lot is happening right now, which we're, I've just talked about, the Denisovans, the Homo hodobagensis and other such things. That's really opening up this other realm, which is really worrying uh, for people into evolution and other such things, um, but what the reason I believe these were covered up is really because you have to understand when evolution, the, the theory was really taken off, it was America and the institutions there, which I believe, as far as I'm aware, I've read a, several books about this. wasn't alive then, obviously, but um, it was it was really almost manipulated and controlled by the Smithsonian and other institutions in North America. They were kind of becoming very very influential and so this spread around different parts of the world and um, and it just doesn't it just this 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 giant thing it doesn't fit the other anatomic anomalies they don't fit they don't want there to be a powerful Native American savage they call them race who were there before the, us the white man they, 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 that's the problem and so you have this kind of it's, it's like a it's a problem I mean they, these were, these were racist people these were racist people into eugenics Nazi philosophies running the running the Smithsonian you have to remember that and so it didn't fit that these so-called savages were much they could have been superior they would have had a large cranial capacity larger brains hence more intelligent than the 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 people who were coming over to America and trying to rule that country in the, the 1800s and so forth. And so that's why I think, I think it was like a, a problem for them because they wanted to be superior and they kept finding evidence that they were not and they didn't want anyone to see that. It didn't fit with that. Plus you have the Manifest Destiny agenda, which is very strong. And it kind of made sense at the time for people, Europeans and people moving over to America. Um, and evolution theory was kicking in at the same time, became the norm, became popular. And they were trying to convince everybody of it at that time. And so you have these uh, amalgamation of things. And it doesn't necessarily equal a conspiracy, which Jim and I believed it was a conspiracy when we started the book, when we started the research. We thought it must be a conspiracy, but it's not. It's not like a big group of people from all over the world are planning this out. Uh, it's just an unfortunate sequence of different negative and racist agendas that created this cover-up. And so that's, that's, that's what I'm aware of. That's what I think was happening. And as for evolution theory, I'm not, I'm not a scientist or anything like that. It's not my field. But when you look at the work of luminaries like Michael Crimo, for instance, um, who's remarkable, he's found evidence of human remains and occupation and other such things going back millions of years. You know, modern human skulls found that some of them fossilized going back several million years, even a billion years, I believe one of them was, or some of them were. And so when you've got that going on, it, it shakes everything up and makes everyone rethink everything. And his book was so controversial, Forbidden Archaeology and the Hidden History of the Human Race, um, that, you know, that alone, just, just his research, and he was, he, he, he was, we're doing what he was doing. He was doing it with the, he was looking into old archaeology reports and discoveries and datings uh, of these particular artifacts and bones. We're doing the same principle, the same kind of research, but looking at the giants and trying to find evidence of that. And so I respect him uh, hugely, and he, he took a lot of criticism, a huge amount, uh, got a lot of threats. <laughs> um, we haven't had too many yet, uh, thank God. But, um, uh, but yeah, so I think that's kind of my idea of, of, of what happened. Um, but yeah, and I think Michael Crimo is the best example. And incidentally, he's actually coming over from America for our conference in November. So we're very happy. And I've got a few questions for him as well. Anyone, anyone else? Um, yes, me please.
Um, I just have one really simple question, I guess. I, I might have missed it, but um, what do you suggest happened to these uh, alleged giants? What happened to the giants? Yes, I mean, where did they go? If they, uh, what do you mean? Did, as in, did they die out? Yeah, did they go extinct yeah. or were they killed? Or yeah, well, in North America, we've got two things going on here. The, the first one is disease, the, the European diseases that came in in the 1500s uh, onwards. Uh, entire tribes were decimated by the flu and the cold and different various European, the measles, smallpox and things like this, which the Native Americans never had on that continent, let alone in, in just small areas. So um, that was one thing. There was a report, we've got to feature it in the book, I forget the details, but um, of one guy who um, visited one place, and then I think 30 years later visited the same place and there was like 2% of the population left because they'd all died of smallpox. So that was one thing that wiped them out. The second thing, because we have to understand they were, they were definitely giant human beings in North America up until at least the 1600s, 1700s, there were a few accounts in the early 1900s. Um, the other thing is that the whole um, kind of tribal communities, they, they kind of got disbanded, they got pushed onto reservations, the, the elite weren't breeding between themselves, the tall ones weren't maintaining their bloodlines, it all got mixed up. Um, there's also one, some people say that the warriors, the tall warriors were always on the front line of any skirmishes or battles that took place, so they got killed off. So there's different theories, but what the main ones are disease and just the movement of the, of the Europeans going over there and messing up their traditions. I think, that, I think that's potentially it. Uh, earlier than that in different countries, I'm really not sure, but I think it's just uh, become the norm that we, we've lost the height. But some, some countries still have that, and s some tribes in Africa are extremely tall still. Yes, I, I, uh, I have a question about um, the Hopi Indians and the Indians in Arizona and that, and that region, they're talking about ant people, so-called ant people. And maybe these uh, giants, they have disappeared into the inner uh, part of the world, you know, the inner earth. Uh, civiliz civilizations, uh, it could be, uh, that's a theory. But uh, my, uh, my question is, uh, do, do you think there's a connection between the Olmec, Olmec uh, civilization and, and uh, the giants because of these giant uh, faces uh, in the Olmec uh, culture, Mesoamerica? Okay, so basically you're asking about you know, disappearing into the earth, potentially the hollow earth, and you're also talking about the Olmecs. Well, the, well, uh, Firstly, with the, the idea, there are traditions of giants coming up from inside the earth and disappearing back into the earth. You get, you get that in uh, various cultures around the world, in fact. So that's something that Andrew Collins and I have been talking about um, over the last couple of years. We have got some traditions that talk about that we feature in the book, but it's very vague, uh, very limited stories of that. But that is one thing, because they keep finding all these tunnels, in, even in North America, in the southwest, for instance, in uh, Arizona and um, other places. As for the Olmecs, that's just it's part of the same landmass, really. It's just the other side of the Gulf Coast. Something I'm fascinated by. I've been researching for years, in fact. Um, there, I don't know if any of you are aware, but the, the, probably most of you know this, but the Olmecs were this, they were like the mother culture of Mexico on, along the northern Gulf Coast. Um, they built pyramids, they're sophisticated stonemasons, and these giant Olmec heads, they look like Western African people, they do not look like Native Americans. And this has caused huge controversy about where they came from and who they were. But interestingly, you talk about giants, they're, I'm just about to start on an article about the giants of ancient Mexico because we have a large amount of data of that. Even Teotihuacan, the famous mega pyramid site near Mexico City, was said to be built by giants. It was uh, built by uh, Quetzalcoatl, uh, sorry, the Quinametzin giants, they're called. Um, we have various Aztec codices that depict giants being slaughtered by normal-sized humans. So there, is th there are things going on in Mexico, and it certainly could have been the same kind of case where the elites spread between themselves and eventually died off. Is that, is that all right? <laughs> Hi, Hugh. Um, I, there's a few things that, that struck me. You know, did they ever find any children's um, bodies, skeletons of children? Yeah, there are some like that, yeah, that yeah. were very tall. Yeah. yeah, and then, you know, another thing that struck me was that you were talking about there was some wheat that was found. Yeah. And then they grew it and it grew yeah. quite high. Yeah. And it just struck me, it just sounds like some GMO product. 
Okay, <laughs> that's number one. <laughs> and I just want to ask, do you think we're going to be giants again? Uh, there, there, well, there are. I've seen, I've seen some. But, but, you know, I'm just thinking, yeah. you know, gen my generation, my mother's and my grand, we've all got taller. I've not got that much taller. Yeah, but I've yeah. got children who are six feet tall, you know, so... <laughs> and yeah. it's all because they see the food, the diet's getting better, and this is why people are getting taller. So it just struck me, has it got something to do with the food? That they all became giants, and it was special food for giants? The that's, that's good point, ordinary man. people didn't eat. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It was just these that's things that you. Spinach or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But it just struck me as we go and become giants again, because now the diet is getting better, we're all getting taller. You know, and we, we know that GMOs give them um, cancer, they give you some other um, problems in the, the body. Could it have give, given two sets yeah. of teeth? Okay. Two rows of teeth? You know, this is just where yeah. well, my mind went when you were talking about... Yeah, so you're talking about food, whether food and environment and things like that would affect the height of populations and, and, think, and such things. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I do agree. Yeah, that, that, that is, there's some data that we are getting taller as humans are getting slightly taller because we have access to such high quality food and water and environment and things like this uh, that we that is possible there are some areas around the world where that that is happening but one of the things that you mentioned is is the corn the type of food <laughs> i don't know how i'm going to summarize this quickly but um we do, we do put this in the book the, the origins of the tall one chat tall ones chapter where there's this whole thing to do with uh, the, the, and these are written in the traditions of the, the some of the Native American cultures, I believe, that they talk about enhancing the energy and the environment and like enchantment of the landscape by the placement of mounds, the geometry, the manipulation of the earth energies, and so forth. And there's some magical things that were recorded and witnessed by some. Um, British and European people, where these Native American like magicians or sorcerers were able to like place a piece of uh, you know corn in their hand and a small piece of you know soil, and just within seconds they would grow it from a seed to full height piece of corn, fully developed within seconds, and people were witnessing this with their own eyes. So they had the, the somehow they had the magical power to do such things and that's not there's more than one of these fine deloria has written an entire book about this kind of thing with the sorcerers and the magicians of ancient native america so we know that they could do that magically so but there must be some science behind that and there is some science it's, it's written by john burke and Kaj halberg in a book called seed of knowledge stone of plenty where they visited many of the mound sites and megaliths of north america and sites everywhere else around the world and proved that the ancients had an understanding of natural telluric currents of the earth, magnetism and other such things which could enhance crops and seeds. You could literally place seeds in a, this sort of sanctified or power spot in an ancient site. It would enhance it so much, they would then go and plant it and the yield and size would be much greater than if it wasn't placed in that particular spot before it was planted. And so then we looked into that and there's actually different types of electromagnetic energy which can enhance growth in humans. And this has been proven. So we have to question, did the elite understand this in native, uh, sorry, North America and actually build these sites and these mound sites and live on top of them? Because there's proof they lived on top of them sometimes. And actually they were, all the energy was going into their families and, they, and that was increasing their, their size. Now this, this sounds a bit crazy, I'm sure. The, the skeptics in here, you know, are questioning that. Uh, but we, we put it as a speculative theory in the book because there could be something in that. So not only were they affecting potentially their crops and the size of their crops and the quality and f fertility of them, but they were also doing it for themselves. So there is, it's just a small, we only do a couple of pages on it, but we, we, put, we put that in the book. So maybe that partly answers your question, but I, I do believe we, will, we are growing as a race, and, it can, and we, we could, if we knew how to do it exactly, we could probably all get a bit taller, yes. I was thinking about uh, giants and Nordic mythology. If you have found any correlation between the, um, like the gods, and we have some mounds we think that the Vikings made, or do you know anything? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know too much about uh, the Nordic mythology, a little bit, 
but there are the ice giants and things like this. There's there's different um, stories, um, but the, the gen, gen, generally the Nordic sort of type is much taller, much taller. And this was you know when they arrived in different countries, the Vikings and other such things, they were seen as giants, and and, and the accounts sort of put them as giants. So yes, that certainly the case. There is evidence of Vikings and others arriving in North America, but many of these, I, I do agree with you, and, and they were probably, some of the bones were discovered are known to be Viking and other such things, but the, the, the archaeological evidence dates it much further back than that, gen generally. There's some mounds which are archaic mounds going back to at least 2,500, 3,000 BC, even in the Ohio Valley. Uh, and much older, if we go much further south into Louisiana, Watson Break and Poverty Point and others. And so we know that um, there is a much, it's much earlier than the Vikings, especially in North America, but certainly the Nordic type is, is tall and that's something that has been noted. It's something we haven't had a chance to research yet, we're going to do that in a future book. But thank you, thank you for the question. Hi, um, I just have um, a comment and a question. Um, just the, the earlier question of why the cover-up, why um, people might be interested in it. In my theory is that, well, it's really about creating a version of history to control the future. It's a bit like if um, suddenly our memories were wiped today, we wouldn't really know what to do tomorrow because a lot of what we're doing tomorrow is based on what we believe about the past. And um, so I think that's why it's uh, pretty important well, that the people who are trying to hide these things, um, that's why they're doing what they're doing. One reason. But um, the other question that I have is really about to what extent the, the narrative that we have for a lot of the evidence that we find about giants is actually distorted. Because, I mean, we have the evidence and then we have the narrative about the evidence and those are two separate things. Um, and, you know, I mean, for example, Serpent's Mound. Um, to me, that picture looks like a, a sperm and an egg. Um, uh, on the other hand, the archaeologist might say, oh, it's, it's a ceremonial drawing. If indeed it's a sperm and an egg, which some uh, uh, scientists think it is, then it suggests that these people had microscopes. And that might change the entire picture of what we're actually seeing. So. I'm just really wondering about um, the narratives that we see even from the Smithsonian, some of the books that we have, whether or not, to a large extent, even the history books that we think are valid have been fabricated. I think we're all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to admit. No, I mean, there's so little um, evidence and historical anything written down. It's, it's just not there in many cultures. but. That's why I thank people like Vine Deloria, who actually wrote it all down. He interviewed all the Native American elders. He was got the stories. And he found, that because he was Native American himself, although he was a scholar as well, and an activist, he found that, um, that the Native American elders he was talking to, so the stories that were passed down, he said they weren't literally not one vowel, not one word was changed. And if one single piece of it was changed, it would lose its power because these were like exact histo histories that were given. And some of these go back to the time of the megafauna, which is 12,000 years ago. And so people, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying, because we don't know a lot of it. And, and, and even people disagree with these Native American traditions, which frustrates me, because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not American or anything, I've got no connection with it, I've just become absolutely compelled by it. But after speaking with Ross Hamilton, who was good friends with people like Vine Deloria, you have to really, I take their word as the truth. I really, I really do. I, and when, so now, when I look at folklore and stories, I look at it as you know, I look at it as a version of the truth, and kind of bring that in and sort of see if there's any evid more evidence to back that up. Because often it is the truth. In some other cultures, they change it all the time and make stuff up and exaggerate things. But in North America, they don't. And this is something that really Vine Dolores sort of drummed into me well, through reading these books. So that is that is certainly the case, um, but yeah, with the, the narrative, the way it's all um, 
everyone makes up their own narrative. But with Serpent Man, you know, as, as an, another version of history there, I, I think it's a serpent. I, and it's actually, they've actually found wings coming off like the shoulder area. So it's like a winged serpent, it's a plumed serpent, which is a tradition we find in Central America with Quetzalcoatl and Cuckoo We find it in South America with Bochica and Colombia, with Viracocha in Peru and Bolivia. And so you find these same traditions and like you're seeing, the, you're seeing it carved into the earth to say, look, this is, this is what we've got here. And we're gonna make sure people remember this and it's not gonna be budged. This is the megalithic thing as well. You build something that will not be destroyed. And so that, to me, you've got to like, you know, try and just decipher that. But again, you get all these different versions of it. So it's really hard to uh, work out what's going on. But with what we've got here, with the, the giant skeletons and so forth, um, you, you, you kind of just have to work with what we've got because, because of NAGPRA, because of the Smithsonian, we haven't got much to go on. <laughs> we just have to, have to do what we can. So if anyone's got any giant bones, any hidden, show me. Skulls. Okay. Has anyone got double rows of teeth in the audience? <laughs> uh, seriously, I've met. Oh, you have. Fantastic. Good. Well done. But there are. I've, I've, I've had people uh, come up to me like, at my lectures and various other things. And Jim's had the same. Where people. They, oh yeah, my son. He was seven foot tall. He had. He had double rows of teeth. But he got them removed when he was born. I was like, oh, and he grew to be seven feet tall. And I'm like, what the? And just then I got. And they sent me a, a, a you know photo of him and. So we know it's a real thing, and, and there are genetic throwbacks that are occurring now. And this is an example. Of, these are some examples, maybe of that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you for opening the door to the uh, ancient world of our origins. Uh, as you see, there's a lot more to study if you're interested in this subject. Um, by our TV crew, I was advised to tell you that on the Open Mind Conference Facebook site, there's a live uh, transmission, which you can share on your own. Uh, so, so a lot of people have the possibility to see this conference live, so please do that if you are Facebook users. Um, I think it was uh, very interesting, a lot of uh, research, a lot of hours, um, amazing job. Uh, should we give the last hand to... Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Right, you. Good. Yeah.